Hi, Vicky. Uh, welcome to Zap Map Towers. Thanks so much for coming to visit us in, in Bristol. Yeah, pleasure. So, Vicky, CEO of Charge UK, maybe you can do a explain what Charge UK are. Exactly. So Charge UK is a, is a trade association. We represent the EV charging sector in the UK. Uh, we're about two years old, just turned two in fact, and um, we, we, we're, here, we're here really to represent the sector to the media, to government, to parliament and to other very important industry stakeholders such as you and, and all the drivers that you represent. So uh, we're about two years old. We've got 42 members, most of whom are charge operators, um, and I'm the CEO of a small team of three. So uh, really good Brilliant. to be here. Yeah, great, great. And, I, and over the last year, you have been super busy. I've seen you on the Today, or I've heard you on the Today programme, yeah. see you on Sky News, out and about, BBC. So it's, it's been a, a busy year, partly because there's yeah. been such a amazing growth. Absolutely. So it's, it has indeed been busy, but it's, it's that kind of <laughs> sector, isn't it, which is things aren't staying still. I think that's one of the good stories we have to tell, which is uh, the sector has been booming. Uh, last year was, you know, you saw huge growth and you were tracking it all the way through and I was quoting your figures every single month. <laughs> uh, so I think really that was a real combination of the sector really uh, sort of getting to a size and scale where that maturity is coming through. People know how to build, people know where they're building and they're just getting on and building it. And I think that's been really great news because I think tracking through uh, we want to be out there with infrastructure on the ground just ahead of demand so that charging infrastructure is there as people are making their minds about whether to switch to an EV. I think we've achieved that. I think that's possibly slightly telling off now. That's not to be, you know, it's not a problem. I think that's to be expected. We were going at such, such a pace. Um, and I think perhaps we'll now sort of start to track at a, a more sustainable level. But the, 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 the overall story is there. And as the uh, National Audit Office uh, sort of said earlier in the year, we're on track if we keep going at this pace to get to 300,000 charge points by 2030, which is where we want to be. Yeah, brilliant. And, and actually, this first quarter, although it, although the pace has dropped a little bit, actually, mm. we've seen some really big yeah. good news, high visibility hubs coming yeah. out, which which really encourages consumers. Yeah, I think I think it's half the battle here is to be is to be really visual, especially if you're in the rapid part of the market, to show those really nice, big, consumer friendly uh, charging uh, stations. Uh, where people want to go, where they can find it easily, they're well located and they're a great advert to the whole sector. But of course, charge points come in lots of different shapes and sizes. That's one of the great benefits of, of charging. You can charge in lots of different scenarios. So uh, there's also a lot going on in the on-street space and then in destination space as well. They don't all have canopies because that's not appropriate, but there's a lot going on. Yeah, brilliant. And, and I think Levi or the local on-street charging is maybe yeah. last year wasn't the sort of star yeah. of the show, but feels like it's beginning to, to I think that's make about, progress. That's about right. I think last year, 2024, was probably quite frustrating. It's very frustrating for the on-street part of the market. We know that uh, that delivery there is absolutely vital. If you don't have an option to charge at home, that is your home charging. Um, but of course, you can't just turn up at a pavement and put a charge point in. You have to have a contract uh, with a local authority. And the government, the previous government, was quite right in identifying this as a potential area for some subsidy support. So the Levi scheme was created. Uh, but of course, with any big s scheme like that, things are always a bit more complicated than they perhaps uh, they seem at the beginning. And it's taken a while for that funding to come through. So last year was a bit frustrating. The sector wanted to deploy, but the, the contracts weren't there. Um, things are changing. Uh, you know, a, I think there's about 20 procurements out uh, on the market right now, and that will start to increase throughout the rest of the year. And we'll slowly start to see those turn into charge points. And I expect there to be a lot more on street charging uh, being delivered towards the end of this year into next year. So I think that that problem is starting to be solved. Yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, we, we've been reporting on the, the couple of contracts, yeah. for example, Chargy in, in Brighton and Hove, 6,000 charges over the next two years. Yeah. And I think what was interesting to me is that although they got o only, well not only, but they got 2.6 million from the government, but actually the whole project is, is going to be 130 million. Yeah. So lots of private investment too. Exactly. So when we launched two years ago, the members at the time, there's 20, I think when we launched, uh, you know, added up our commitments together and came up with 6 billion, a, a, a huge yeah, amount of huge. money. I suspect it's probably larger now as we have 40, 42 members, but um, that the appetite for investment from a private sector is is there. Now, we don't go into government asking for large sums of money, but that, that the Levi Fund is important to try and unlock that private sector to actually enable the local authorities to work with us. So I think a lot of that money has gone towards uh, allowing local authorities to hire in-house EV managers, which is absolutely vital because we need that counterpart to, to engage within the local authority to make to, to be able to, to deploy. So uh, yeah, local subsidy very important, but there's lots of private money there. Yeah, that's great. And you talked about the sort of broader policy framework. Of course, yeah. in the last last couple of weeks, we've had the results from the the much vaunted yes. Z mandate and yeah. twenty thirty date. I mean, what what's Charge UK's thoughts yeah. on that? 
So the ZEV mandate, if you if you live in EV <laughs> world, has been a, a big a big topic. It's you know an incredibly important thing for the car industry. It sets uh, legal quotas for how many EVs or ZEVs. Uh, car, the car industry must produce on a percentage basis each year, starting from last year. Uh, so it's an imp incredibly important piece of legislation for them, but also probably the most important for us because it gives us a roadmap for how many uh, EVs are going to be coming onto the road. And that's EVs equal customers for us. And it allows us to invest uh, confidently because, of course, we have to invest before charging is needed. Uh, and it takes a number of years for, for charge points to be planned and then deployed. So knowing where we're going is absolutely vital when you're talking about large sums of private investment coming in. So that's been our real kind of North Star. Uh, so you'll have seen me talking quite a lot about the importance of, of that piece of legislation from a charging operator and investment point of view. Um, I think the announcement a couple of weeks ago, light and, light and, light and shade, I think um, the, the really you know, the key point there is that 2030 is a date that's been set and agreed for the phase out of, of petrol and diesel cars. And the headline trajectories for those sales quotas has, has stayed as well. And I think that's no mean feat because if you look around the world, those similar targets have been under pressure uh, in Europe. And we've seen what's happening in, in America where a, a complete change of approach. So I think to have those fixed is absolutely fantastic because we all know that the, the future is electric and it gives us confidence. However, I think what's what's happened is in giving the car industry more flexibility about how to meet those targets, it does take away some certainty from us because that, that path to 2030 is now mm. a little bit more meandering than it was uh, you know, a year ago. Um, so we're still trying to work out as a charging sector what that means and how we might need to adjust accordingly. Uh, and we're talking to the government about you know, how to interpret this. Um, I guess the, the missing part of what was announced uh, you know, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, was the demand side. And I know we've been talking uh, to the government throughout about not just having the regulation there, but the kind of incentives for drivers. How do you make it as easy as possible for drivers to switch over? I know the car industry thinks the same. That bit was missing. Um, I know the circumstances for that. I think it was done in a you know, slight hurry with the tariff situation going on. So hopefully there's a part two coming uh, and I'm, we're very keen to, to have a conversation with the government about what should be in part two. Uh, a number of things that we, we think could happen to make charging you know, more affordable, more, more available, you know, a better experience for all. Yeah, no, it was great to see you go into number 10. So I guess it's sort of watch this space on the on the demand side. Hopefully, yes. Well, we were talking <laughs> to some the right people. So let's see where that goes. Brilliant. That's great. And, you know, I think more, more broadly, so putting the, the policy framework to one side, one of the key benefits of driving electric, apart from the fact they're just better, yeah. faster, yeah. quieter, etc., more environmentally friendly, yeah. has been the, the, the cost yeah. of the cost of, of driving. And yeah. And recently, there's been a number of studies, not least Electric Vehicles UK, cost of electric, of driving electric, yeah. which showed that for 80% of drivers, it would be yeah. more, more cost effective. But we can't get away from the fact that actually that cost of public charging has really risen over yeah. the last few years. And I think talking to people, it's, it's why is it so much more expensive? Mm. And why is it more expensive than the EU? Is there anything we can do about it? So I think, first of all, it's important to say that this, this, you know, the charging sector knows that charging needs to be affordable it's one of the as you say one of the one of the reasons um why uh driving ev is appealing and, and we need to make to continue that case so we we know we don't want uh, affordability of charging to be a barrier to people switching that would be nonsensical these are our customers we want them to switch over um so we're acutely aware of that uh, i think there's also you know this there are some inherent differences in terms of the cost basis on how you you know own and, and run a home charge point versus a public one. It's the same, you know, we often talk about, you know, I can make a cup of coffee at home and it's cost something. And if I go out to my local, you know, uh, barista, it's going to cost something quite different. And there is an element of that in this as well, which is at home, I haven't had to pay for a very large grid connection capable yep. of servicing <laughs> 60, you know, 350 kilowatt chargers. I haven't leased that land from somebody at a prime site and I haven't got the ongoing costs of, of keeping it going. So there are inherent things different. Um, which I think will always be there, but there are some additional things that as a sector we're having to cope with, which we're struggling with and we're asking some governments to, to help with. So you'll have heard about the VAT issue, an, an immediate 15% difference, which which could be resolved uh, very e well easily, but it could be resolved. Just need to get Treasury on board. Just, just like that, yeah. Um, and that would make a huge difference straight off the bat. Then there's some other things which maybe drivers may be less aware of, which are, you know, having an impact on pricing and also investment decisions, actually. Standing charges, we pay them at home, um, but they're a very huge percentage of the costs of, uh, of running a public charge point um, hub in particular. And those costs have risen 
uh, astronomically over the last uh, couple of years, uh, on top of you know, wholesale prices and electricity, which have risen as well. So you know, we all remember that kind of peak uh, during the Ukraine war early years where prices of electricity went up for all of us. Uh, we didn't as a, as a sector, as a uh, benefit from a price cap. And actually those prices are still much higher than they were pre-Ukraine. So a lot of the costs in, in terms of uh, running and operating a, a public charge point are those energy costs and a lot of those have risen and are out of our control. So um, they are those things that the government could do something about. Uh, you know, the whole electricity market is incredibly complicated and doesn't just affect us. Obviously there is some work going on there to try and look at how to make that more sustainable, uh, more cost effective. But there are some specific things like standing charges um, and also a, there's a carbon credit called the RTFO which we think would help here that we're asking the government to help us with which would help us to keep uh, charging affordable. Yeah, no, I, I'm not, I was recently on this Electrify Britain commission yeah. and I could see, sort of open my eyes to the yeah. fact how that there needs to be wholesale electricity yep. 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 market reform as we get this yes. renewable energy. I think the other thing we've seen is that actually some charge point operators are bringing in more innovative Absolutely. pricing. So, you know, there's this off, off peak pricing, yeah. uh, you know, that you can just pay a lot less charging at night, for example. Yeah, no, the sector's not just sitting back and letting no. me go and talk <laughs> and try and persuade, you know, people in government to change things. It, it, it's an, it, we're still a young market. And you're starting to see a lot of innovation coming in, uh, companies working out how to you know, price their products, how to offer it differently, day and night tariffs. So I think we'll see a lot more of that coming through. Uh, smart charging, for example, you can get that at home. But I think some are looking at doing that uh, on street or elsewhere as well. So I think there's a lot going on. A lot of it, though, is out of our hands and we really do need some government help to try and to bring those, those prices down to, uh, to affordable uh, for, for everybody, really. Yeah, no, that, that's really important. And I guess the, apart from cost, the other yeah. question that people bring up is all around reliability. Yeah. We've had the PCPR regulations yeah. came into force in November. So yeah. I guess the charge point operators need to re report on this 99% reliability yeah. by next November. Yeah. You know, ha how, how are you finding the charge point operators sort of reacting to this? So I mean, we welcome those regulations because, I mean, a bit like with affordability, no one sets out to, to <laughs> have a product which is unaffordable and unreliable. They all get up every single day to try and do the best thing they can can and to make the product as reliable as possible. It's not just reliability, it's the whole experience, it's yeah. how do you pay, how easy is it, uh, what's, the, what's the physical experience like. They're all devoted to trying and making that as, as, as good as possible. I think it is, even before we see the numbers, I think we all know, those of us who do charge, the experience has been getting all the time, better all the time. Definitely. I think the role of the regulations has been to create, I guess, two things. One is to provide a kind of safety net, sort of minimum standard uh, for, for everyone to try and aim for and then possibly exceed. Um, and I think that, that you know, those regula regulations are being implemented now by, by charge operators and you'll start to see that coming through in, in the product. But also it does provide a very clear message to consumers about this is, this is the standard to, ex to expect. You can have confidence in this network. Yeah, no, great. And, and I think, you know, when we look at the data from Zapmat's point of view, we can see that it, the reliability, headline reliability has been improving yeah. dramatically yeah. over the last few years. Yeah. And, and consumers are more, sat they're, they're still not fully satisfied with charging, but there are a lot more Who's satisfied. ever satisfied with everything? Who's ever satisfied? Ne never. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so Vicky, thanks so much for, for giving us your insights into charging. Before we go, 2025, we're expecting probably another half a million new, yeah. brand new EVs on the road. Yeah. If we're sitting down this time next year, what would you like to have seen in terms of charging? So I think the sector, as it has been, well, well, is going to keep on deploying and keep improving that experience. So I'm, I'm not concerned about that. What we do need to do is tell people about it. So uh, we've got you know, a lot of new cars coming on, a lot of people switching. Uh, but the majority of people st still have still driving a different type of car and they will be coming on board. We need to tell them what's been going on. I think you're sure you'll find when you're talking to friends and family who are perhaps not in this world in which we live, where we're talking about EVs and charging all day long, they're a couple of maybe you know 18 months behind what's actually happening and why why wouldn't they be uh, we need to tell a story about the progress we've made uh, to give them confidence to make sure that when they're thinking about switching ev uh, charging is not a reason not to switch it's actually a reason to switch so i think it's all about going out there and telling telling the the, the, the progress that's been made and really celebrating it yeah spreading that good news story yep. of all those charges and giving people confidence yep. to switch brilliant yeah i totally agree with that well thanks so much vicky for coming along and uh, yeah we'll speak to you soon thank you very much <laughs>